All right. So, what we've been looking at is Romans chapter 11. We've been doing that uh, a few weeks now. And uh, clearly, uh, as you go to Romans 11, and hopefully you haven't closed your Bible, because that's where we are. Um, so, last week we sort of looked at the idea of um, uh, these, the replacement theology um, that, that sort of taking away all the blessings away from the Jewish people and applying it to the church. And so Paul says exactly the same sort of thing. Don't be boasters. Don't boast about what is happening. Uh, verse 18, for example, boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. And uh, verse 20, it talks about being high-minded. And there is people who are so high-minded, um, what's, that, what's that saying? So high-minded, they're of no earthly use. Or spiritually-minded, they're of no earthly use. Heavenly-minded. Heaven, heavenly minded they're of, okay. Thank you, Jan. She always corrects me. Um, so maybe I should have written that in my notes. Or something. Um, anyway, so be not high-minded. And... Um, God spared, obviously, in verse 21, spared the natural branches and uh, he will graft them back in. And it's easy to graft back in the natural branches um, because, obviously, it's, it's natural. You know, it's unusual for us as Gentiles to be grafted into the root because we're unnatural. And uh, so, as we continue looking at this, uh, especially in, in the passage that uh, was read to us, that it's important for us to know that the same sort of questions uh, was asked about the Christians in, that Paul was writing to in, in Romans. What about the Jewish people? What has happened about the Jewish people? What about them? You know, And as we started off the series, we said that, and, and the Bible clearly teaches that it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, if you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are entered into the family of God, and God doesn't recognize ethnicity. There we go. Um, I have all sorts of problems with my tongue these days. Um, so he doesn't recognize these differences. Okay, so if, if you're in the family, in God's family, there's no Jew or Gentile. There's no bond, in other words, a slave or a free. There's no male, no female. God sees everyone the same. So in the family of God, so if a Jew accepts the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, they cannot claim, oh, but I'm a Jew, or therefore I'm better than you Gentiles. No, because God doesn't recognize that uh, people group. Okay, he doesn't recognize people groups. I'll just say that because I have trouble saying ethnic, <laughs> ethnic, <laughs> ethnic, <laughs> ethnicity. Okay, and so therefore, uh, and yet still, we see that there's Gentiles and we see that there are Jewish people around. So outside the family of God, God still recognizes Gentiles. He still recognizes Jewish people. And the question that was asked, um, go back to verse 1, uh, where people were asking, or these new Christians were asking, well, we're saved now. What's happened to the Jewish people? And uh, Paul says, I say then, hath God cast away his people? God forbid, for I, am, uh, for I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. And so uh, he hasn't cast away his people. So we need to then reconcile what's happened to the nation of Israel. Well, the nation of Israel is treated, or the Jewish people is treated exactly the same as unbelievers, regardless if they're Jewish, regardless if they're Gentiles. In this dispensation of grace, Every single person has to trust Christ. That's why we have missionaries in Israel. That's why we have different missionary groups going to Israel to witness to the Jews. We have different uh, people who go and witness to Jews in other countries. 
And so Israel My Glory is a prime example of that. And Israel My Glory is going to speak um, in, in a couple of weeks' time, on the uh, 10th of uh, November. Well, a couple of weeks, but pretty close. Uh, so Paul then gives a general reference to the New Covenant which God's promise to convert Israel and forgive her sin. Israel's sin is going to be forgiven and give her a new heart of obedience. Remember, these are God's people. These are God's chosen people. God's chosen people. God hasn't cast them away, and all the, the blessings and the promises haven't been applied to the church. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31. Because if all the promises have been given to the church, as the replacement theologians would have, then we have an issue. Because how do we reconcile the promises that God gives in his word to the nation of Israel? Then obviously, God must be wrong. And is God wrong? He's no. never wrong. He's never in error. So chapter 31 Drop down to 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, where, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, uh, saith the Lord. <coughs> but, uh, we're going down to 34. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. So where is the replacement theology in that verse? I can't find it. If God himself says, I'm going to make a new covenant with them, and they're all going to know me from the least to the greatest, all know me in verse 34, then that's impossible to happen unless you apply Israel to the church. So now, there's no such thing as Jew or Gentile. We're all Israelites. We're all Jews. And that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Over to chapter 32, verses 38 through to 40. Verse 38. And they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me forever. Now, how long is forever? A long time. It's eternity. So if the church has replaced the Jews, and all the promises claimed that is given to the Jews in these Old Testament passages, that indeed God says, they will be my people and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever. Well, what's happened? This obviously wasn't written to the Gentiles, was it? It was written to the Jews. If we continue on, down to verse 40, it says, and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and of their children after them. And I will make them an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. So the, these people, God is going to draw them unto himself. Now, in this dispensation, 
we're a little bit different. Gentiles are different than the Jewish people. The Jewish people have been chosen, a chosen people. Abraham, and we'll look at that in a moment. Abraham was the first person to be chosen by God, right? He was called out. Now, was Abraham a Jew or a Gentile when he was born? Put it that way. When he was born, was he born a Jew or a Gentile? A Gentile. He was a Gentile. God had chosen him. Out of him will come this nation. The father of faith. The father of faith. And so God has given a different call to the Jewish nation. And they, at the moment, have been taken out. And we have been grafted in, in Romans chapter 11. But these natural branches will once again, in the end, be grafted back in. Now, I want us to go to Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David. So, Zechariah chapter 13 and verse 1. And there's a lot of confusion about the word elect and things like that because of Calvinism that has crept into the church and all these things and then replacement theology which has crept into the church. And so there's a whole lot of confusion about the Jewish people. Now remember, dispensation of grace, which we are living in today, if the Jews accept the Lord Jesus Christ, they are entered into God's family, and God des does not recognize whether they're a Jew or a Gentile. He doesn't recognize that fact, because we're all family. And so therefore, we, as, as Paul says, we shouldn't boast. And nor can the Jews boast, because we're all treated equally. We're all treated equally. In uh, Zechariah 13, verse 1, in that day... the there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Where is Jerusalem? In Israel. In Israel. This is not talking about the church. It's not talking about the church. It doesn't say, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Rome. Or should I say, the Vatican City for sin and for uncleanness. Well, I guess there is a lot of sin and uncleanness in the Vatican City. But it's Jerusalem. Jerusalem. God's people. <coughs> God's chosen people. But we just keep them aside. We've just separated them out for the moment. We've just separated them out for the moment. Let's go back to Romans 11. In verse 25. Romans 11 verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Until the fullness of the Gentile world reigns are complete. Okay, so we have the Egyptian world rule, we have the Assyrian world rule, the Babylonian world rule, these are all Gentiles. And then we have the Grecian world rule, the Medes and the Persians world rule, they're all, they are all Gentiles. Then we have the Roman world rule, Gentile. And then we have the revived Roman world rule, which is during the tribulation period, Again, Gentiles. Gentiles. And then once that's completed, then God will turn and graft these people in. Verse 30. Um, For as ye, that's Gentiles, in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. 
received mercy through their unbelief. The covenant, this new covenant that God will make with his people. Now, it doesn't necessarily annul the covenant, the initial covenant. The unconditional covenant God made with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. And nowhere in the Bible does he say that he cancels it. He wipes it. He talks about a new covenant, but the old covenant is still in existence. Okay, the old covenant is still in existence with the nation of Israel. Let's go to um, Genesis 15. And this includes the land. Now, when we looked at the new covenant, the new covenant is for them to get saved, and I'll put that in quotation marks. God's going to give them a new heart, a new heart, and they will trust the Lord. Genesis 15 and verse 18. It says, In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Ab Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, now, what are the boundaries of this land? From the, river you've, uh, from the river of Egypt, and what's the river of Egypt, commonly known as? Nile. Nile. Unto the great river, the river Euphrates. From the river of Egypt, unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So currently, they have this little slither of the land. This little slither of a land, if you put it on a map, it's so small, and yet the whole world wants it. <laughs> the whole world wants that a little bit. In particular, they want Jerusalem, right? And yet when you put it over overlay, and here we see the river Nile, right, and, and the red line there, let's put on top of that what God actually promised. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There you go. That's what God actually promised. That's the promised land. And yet, that's what they've got. They've just got this little slither. And yet all of that is what they're going to get. So, verse 18 gives us the boundary of the true promised land. The true promised land. And we can continue reading about in Genesis. Let's turn, actually, we'll go to Genesis 12. Let's turn back a few pages. Because the details of God's covenant or the promises that are listed in Genesis 12, verses 1 through to 3. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now when it says all families, what does that mean? Oh. All families. Okay, there's, there's no exclusion here. All the families of the earth will be blessed. It's not limited atonement. It's not limited to, to just the elect, as Calvinists would preach and teach. All the families of the earth will be blessed. So the first thing that he said, go. Okay. Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred. He had to leave his homeland. He had to be obedient. He had to put his faith and trust in God. Where, he was, going to, where was he going to go? Where was he going to go? Well, it says there, unto a land that I will show thee. When the nation of Israel left Egypt to go to the promised land, they had no clue, no idea where they were going. 
They were going in one direction. God led them. He took them. And this is saying here. Go, leave your homeland, and you'll become a great nation. And he would have children, he would have grandchildren, and he would have great-grandchildren, etc., leading to a large group of people. Large group of people. Promise fulfilled through Isaac, Jacob, who was then later renamed Israel, and 12 sons to be the 12 tribes of Israel. And we can read about that. It's history, or his story. Abraham would be great. How many people do you think has heard of, of Abraham? Well, you think about the Muslim, other Christian groups, uh, religious groups, the Jews, almost everyone has heard of Abraham. Almost everyone has heard of Abraham. Abraham, I will make of thee a great nation and will bless thee. In verse 2. And thou shalt be a great nation. Abraham would be a blessing. By faith, it's a great example of faith. God said that those that bless him and his people would be blessed. And those who would curse him and his descendants would be cursed. God still loves his people. And fifth point here, families of the earth will be blessed through Jesus Christ. Who died for our sins, was buried for our sins, and rose again from the dead so that we might have life, life eternal. Let's go to Galatians chapter 3. We cannot write off this nation. We cannot write off this nation. As prominent theologians would do. And just wipe them off. All the people that are in the land at the moment, are not, uh, they're not really the Jews. Well, if they're not Jews, where are the Jews? How do we know? How can we tell? Because after all, their DNA shows them to be Gentiles, basically. Because they come from Abraham, who was a Gentile. Okay, and in uh, chapter 3, verses 8 and, 8 and 9. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And thee shall all nations be blessed. So then, they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. It's all by faith. All by faith. And so, it's important for us to recognize, firstly, in this dispensation, we have the church age. So we have unbelievers, either side, Gentiles on one side, Jewish people on the other side, and we have the church of God. Gentiles who come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior are entered into the bride of Christ or the church, and they are no, they, their ethnicity is no longer recognized. The Jews who trust the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah or their Savior are also placed into God's family, the church, the bride of Christ, and their ethnicity is no longer recognized. But still we have these unsaved groups either side. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be got, come in, and during the tribulation period, God will then turn again to his people. Not to the Gentiles, the unsaved Gentiles, because we all have the opportunity. And turns back to them. And they will then be grafted in as a natural branch once the Gentile uh, reign 
comes to an end. World reign comes to an end. So God promises uh, God's kingdom. Okay? So when God then turns again back to his people, and remember that God hasn't cast away his people, in this dispensation, the gospel is preached to them just as it is to the Gentiles. It makes no difference to God what background you have, whether you're a slave or whether you're a male or a female or um, a uh, whatever, whatever ethnic group you come from, it makes no difference. The gospel is being preached. But then God says, once that has happened, I'm going to turn to back and establish my kingdom. My kingdom. And of course, the Jews will have a part in that kingdom. So let's go to Daniel. Daniel, chapter 7, verse 14. I wonder if someone could grab me some water, please. It's feeling a bit dry. Thank you, Jan. Down in verse 14. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people... Nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, uh, that which shall not be destroyed. You see, the Egyptian world rule finished. The Assyrian world rule finished. The Babylonian world rule finished. The Grecian world rule finished. The Persian the Romans, I keep on getting them around the wrong way. The, the Roman rule is all finished. The Antichrist rule, world rule, will finish. But Christ's rule and his kingdom will never ever end. Will never ever end. Notice, notice that in that verse 14. And there was given him a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Who is the him? The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ. This is the goal for God. Not a goal in a sense, because he knows exactly what he's going to do and he's going to achieve what he does. But he says, I'm going to create my own kingdom where I will rule and establish my kingdom on earth, which will never, ever cease. Okay, like all the Gentile world rules have all ceased. Mine will never cease. And out of that, I'm going to have a people. And that people, of course, will be the Jews. But there will also be Gentiles. There will also be Gentiles. Now, we don't want to uh, confuse too much at this point, so I won't go down that path just yet, but I will in a moment. So God told Paul that Christ, if we go back to Galatians chapter 3 again, that Christ redeemed us from the law. <coughs> That we would become partakers with the Jews in a sense. And, and that's this world dominion. And of course remember the church, that's you folk, are going to rule and reign with Christ for that thousand years. Um, so, we'll get, come to that in a moment. I still, I still don't want to go down that uh, path just yet. Galatians 3 verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Notice it's capital S. The Holy Spirit through faith. Through faith. That the blessing of Abraham might come 
on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So that doesn't mean to say that the church has replaced Israel, and God still will deal with the nation of Israel, but God, we are a part participating, no, we have been given the opportunity to enter in to the blessings of Abraham in the sense of the blessings of God. And so it's an everlasting covenant. This covenant is everlasting, given to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, and although the Jewish people have rejected the Messiah, God, the covenant is from God to man, meaning it is not dependent on man. It's God's covenant, not dependent on man keeping it, but God keeping it. God never breaks his covenant. He never breaks his word. He will continue to keep that covenant. Man breaks his word all the time. You know, a husband, and, well, husband and wife, two people get married together, right? A woman and a man getting married. And then two years down the track, I don't love you anymore. And the covenant is broken. We see that in the world all the time. All the time. People breaking covenants. Man can break a covenant. God will never break a covenant. If you drop down to verse 17. And this I say that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So this covenant that God is going to give to the nation of Israel will never be disannulled. The promises of the enjoyment of the blessings that comes out of that for the Gentile people will never ever be disannulled. Will never be disannulled. Over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6. I must preach on that one day. Because some people believe that Hebrews chapter 6 teaches that we can lose our salvation. Chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6, verses 13 and 14. For when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. So God promised this to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. He promised the land and he gave the boundaries of that land. And he promised that. So why would he break his promise if you take replacement theology as his word, God has done away with the nation of Israel and all the promises that God's given to the Jews are no longer applicable to them. And all can be claimed by the church. You have a problem. You have a problem because then you're saying that God has broken his word to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And that does not make sense. So this means that the physical prom uh, promises to Israel, such as the land, the spiritual pro uh, promises of salvation, that's the new covenant that came, came through the Messiah, are everlasting under the Abrahamic covenant. Whether it's the physical nature, the blessings of the land, the, the kingdom, whatever it may be, and also the, the spiritual, where God will give them a new heart and they will trust Him and serve Him, is an everlasting covenant. God will never, ever break that. And if you say, okay, I believe in replacement theology, well then, God has broken His word. God has changed his mind. We might as well be burning the Old Testament and all the Old Testament prophecies because they no longer apply. And of course there are some um, 
Christian groups who are hyper-dispensationalists or ultra-dispensationalists who would then I say only the Pauline epistles are applicable to the church. But what does the Bible say in Timothy? What does Paul say in Timothy? All scripture. All scripture. Let's turn to Revelation chapter 1. Turns. So we have the rapture, which is an invisible, um, or in, uh, invisible. The people are going to disappear, and that's pretty visible, because <laughs> they're going to be invisible. They're not going to be around. Okay. So all of a sudden, here, here is Eva looking after a patient, and she's busy doing something, and all of a sudden she's gone. Do you think that's going to be unnoticed? I think it's going to be noticed. The poor old lady who's still sitting on the toilet waiting for Eva to come and help her. Get off! Help! She's busy ringing the bell. <laughs> but here, behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. Now, every eye shall see him. Every eye means? Every eye. All. And they also which pierced him. And so the Lord is coming back. And so if the replacement, if, if the Jews have been replaced by the church, why make this point? Why make this point? And why make this point? And Zechariah, let's go back to Zechariah. Does Zechariah not know what's going on? Or does God not know what's going on? You know, we are supposed to replace the Jews. Zechariah chapter 8, verse 20 to 23. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord. Now this is the millennial reign, right? And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Go to another city, that is. Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Now watch this. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men, ten Gentile men, shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a churchgoer. No. No. That is a Jew. Now, if the Jews are finished with, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard, we have heard that God is with you. you. Who? With who? You. With you, the Jew. Okay? So God is with the Jews. They are going to be the, the, the people group for the nations during the, uh, tr during the millennial reign. <clears throat> These are the people group that will help worship God. Because this is they're going to go from one city, Gentile city, to another Gentile city looking for Jews and say, I want to go to Jerusalem and we want to worship. And they will grab hold, it says here, ten men. Ten men shall take hold out of all languages of nations, that's Gentiles, because if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. Got to grab hold of my coattails. Come! We've heard that God is with you, the Jew. 
Turn back, or over, sorry, not back, over to chapter 12. Verse 10. <coughs> and I will pour upon the house of... Who? David? Now who's David? What's special about him? He's a Jew, isn't he? Jew. And upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Who do you think lives in Jerusalem? Of course, Jews mainly. There'll be Gentiles there too, but... Inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So, the Jewish people will come to know the Lord. That's, that's the new covenant, the salvation covenant that God has promised to his people. The physical covenant still exists. God hasn't disannulled that. They're going to get that land that you saw on the map. They're going to get it. In fact, they're going to, it's going to be a world kingdom. Let's go back to Romans 11. Romans 11. So I'll finish shortly. Folks, Romans chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Now, Paul is speaking to these Christians that are in Rome, right? And as I'm reading this, I'm, I'm reading it to Christians here in Christchurch. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So the blindness is going to be taken away once the fullness of the Gentiles is fulfilled. So there's no more world Gentile rule. Every eye will see it. Every eye will see it. And the Jewish nation, and, and they'll be thinking, Ah, the penny has dropped. What have we done? What have we done? So blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. And so all of the church. No. And so all the Gentiles. No. And so all Israel shall be saved. Yes. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. And Jacob, what was his new name? Israel. 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 And yet there are Christians today, well, I'll put that in quote, I should have put that in quotation marks, who would disagree with God. You're wrong, God. You're wrong, Paul. God's finished with those Jews. They crucified Christ. They had their opportunity. They've pushed him aside. They've neglected him. And so, God, you have finished with Israel. That's what they're saying. Constantine, the first Roman Caesar to declare himself as a Christian. He declared himself a Christian, whether he was or not. It's debatable. Became sole ruler of the entire empire in AD 323. He began an increasing hostility policy towards the Jews. What was the thinking of the day? No different than what Romans, the beginning of Romans 11. Christians were thinking, well, God is finished with the Jews. They are the ones that crucified him. They should be punished for crucifying the Messiah. And so, open 